running. Here's an interesting thing about running. I've got a whole message on this that I don't have time to do, but there's a number of cases in the Bible where when people ran from something, no matter how many years it took, eventually God made them go back to that place they ran from. Moses ran from Egypt. He got a little bit ahead of God's plan and he felt this sensing that God wanted to use him to deliver the Israelites. You know, sometimes you feel a call on your life, but you get a little bit ahead of yourself. And it don't work out quite so well. So make sure you got God's timing to the best of your ability. So he killed this Egyptian. Another one saw him started blaming him and was going to go tell somebody. And so the Bible says clearly in Acts 7, 29, at this remark, when he heard the man, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, Midian, where he fathered two sons. Forty years. He needed 40 years out there in the desert to be prepared for what God had for him to do. Everybody wants to do something for God, but let me ask you, how many of you are willing to do the years of preparation? I said the years. You remember the two boys whose mother went to Jesus and said, I'd like for my sons to sit one on your right hand and one on your left. And his answer was so classic. He said, you don't have any idea what you're asking for. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink? See, it's easy to want something. It's easy to want a position. But there's always a lot of hard work that goes with it and a lot of changes in our life and a lot of doing things that we may not necessarily want to do. And I'm not trying to, to paint a nasty picture. I just think that we need to be honest with people and tell them that it's not all going to be fun and games. I don't have enough time left in my life to tell you what it took for me to get from where I started 42 years ago to standing here today. I don't have enough time to tell you the tears, the pain, the crying, the millions of times I wanted to give up the hard work and on and on and on. But it's, it's the best, it, it's been the best life, the best opportunity that anybody could ever have. I was sitting and thinking the other day about some of the things that God has let me do. And so I'm really trying to say to you today, if you think that there's something God wants you to do, then don't let anything stand in your way. Don't, don't run away from anything, run to it. I love the part of the David and Goliath story where it says that after he had this conversation with Goliath and Goliath said, I'm gonna kill you. And David said, no, I'm gonna kill you. It says that David ran quickly toward the battle line. And I love that. You know, sometimes if you stare at your giants too long, sometimes you stare at them too long, you're gonna to get too scared to go after them. A lot of times, we just got to move. If you're going to move with God, you're going to have to move by instinct. You're going to have to move by, this is not a pretty word, but by your gut. You, you do what you know is right in here because you can think something to death. There are people already here that you have not done what God has given you opportunity to do because you thought about it too much. You thought about the sacrifice too much. You thought about what other people were going to say too much. You thought about the judgment, the criticism, and you will get all of that and more if you want to work for God. But it's worth it. There were other things I had to confront. God told me the time would come when I would have to confront my father. All the years that he abused me, nobody ever talked about it. Abuse is the stupidest thing 
sexual abuse, and especially back then, nobody talked about it. Yeah, you know, I think I might have been one of the first people as far as a ministry person who actually got up in the pulpit and started talking about this kind of stuff. And it happens to so many people, and somebody needs to talk about it. And I'm very glad that I did. But I had never confronted my father. I had never said, we need to talk about what you did to me. And I did not want to because he controlled me with fear all those years. And to be point blank honest, I was just afraid of him. But God put in my heart first, the time's going to come when I'm going to ask you to go do it. He said, it's not yet, but be ready. When I tell you, you got to go. I told Dave about it. I said, it's not yet, but when I got to go, I'm going to need you to go with me. Well, everybody in my family hid from it. My mother hid from it. My brother hid from it. My dad hid from it. There were other relatives in our family that knew full well what he was like and what he was doing. None of them wanted to get involved, so they hid from it. One night, God just said, it's time. I didn't have no time to think about it, and if I would have, I'd still be sitting back there thinking about it. So I went and just sat down on the floor right in front of him, and I said, it's time for us to talk about what you did to me. Oh, my God. He just got so flustered. My mother ran around. She was running around the house and running into other rooms. And, you know, people get comfortable hiding from their stuff. And so I, I said, what you did was wrong. It hurt me very badly. But God's using me now. And I said, one of the things that I'm going to tell you is I'm going to be going on television and I tell the story of what happened to me and I just want to let you know that the word's going to get out. <laughs> I'm not going to keep it a secret any, any longer. And um, <laughs> You know what? Long story short, when he was 83, I got to lead him to the Lord and I baptized him and so... It all ended up okay. I had to do a lot of things in my life afraid. Just because you feel afraid doesn't get you off the hook of obeying God. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Well, courage is forward motion while you feel afraid. You do it afraid. You don't run from something just because you feel afraid. That's when you need to run to it so you don't have to run from it the rest of your life. Come on, let's say that again. When you're afraid of something, that's when you need to run to it, get it over with, because if you don't, you'll be running from it the rest of your life. I got anybody in here today that needs to deal with some issues in your life? How many of you have a person that you've let use you way too long and it's time for some confrontation? Need to do it. Nope, they won't like it. I don't know, they may never speak to you again. But you're only responsible to God. Now, we got to learn in life, too, if we're going to have breakthroughs, how to shake off some stuff. Acts 28, 1 through 5. After we were safe on land, we found that the island we were on was called Malta. And the natives showed us extraordinary kindness and hospitality, for they kindled a fire and welcomed us all since it had begun to rain and was cold. But when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks and laid them on the fire, a viper, which is a snake, crawled out because of the heat and fastened itself onto Paul's hand. When the natives saw the creature hanging from his hand, they began to say to one another, undoubtedly this man is a murderer, and though he's been saved from the sea, justice, the avenging God, has not permitted him to live. Because what they always saw was that if a snake bit a person, they died. 
Then Paul simply shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. So from that, I've made a whole message, which you're only going to get a little tiny bit of, just called shake it off. And you know, shake it off just means that when the devil bites you in any way, shape, or form, whether it's through rejection or somebody hurting you or some kind of abuse, when he puts his fangs into you, you don't have to let that do you in. You can shake it off. And what I mean by that is you can simply just make your mind up, I'm not, I'm not going to let this stop me. I'm not going to let this do me in. I'm not going to. There's another example that Paul gives about the disciples that I think is very interesting. In Luke chapter 10, verses 10 and 11 and 16, whatever city you enter and they don't welcome you, go out into its streets and say, even the dust of your feet, which clings to our feet, we wipe off, one translation says we shake off in protest against you breaking all ties. Yet understand this, that the kingdom of God has come near you and you rejected it. The one who listens to you listens to me and the one who rejects you rejects me. And the one who rejects me rejects my heavenly father who sent me. Now, a reality check. Look at me and face this fact. No matter what you do, no matter how hard you try, no matter how good you are, everybody's not going to like you. <laughs> and so the ones that you run into that don't, you got to learn how to just shake that off. Come on, let's practice a little bit today. Shake it off. See, we're going through life and we get hurt and we let it stop us. And then we either sit there and we bleed for months or we let it affect us in some way and so we, we carry that around with us. The moment you get hurt, the best thing that you can do is say, hurting people hurt people. I'm shaking that off. I'm not going to take it into myself. God, you can heal me and make this thing right. Come on. I wonder how many people are here today that have been rejected a few times and it's been painful and so now you don't you you won't even get out and live life the way you want to live life because you've let the fear of being rejected again control you well you know what they rejected Jesus and he made it and they said when people reject you they reject me so really, if I'm trying to help somebody and they reject me, they're not really rejecting me, they're rejecting the one who sent me. Don't let the fear of people not approving of you control your life. You'll never have the breakthroughs that God wants you to have if you care so much about what people think that you become frozen in fear. Yeah. Wonder how many people there are in here right now today who wanted to step out and try something for God and you started getting the little messages, well, if you do that, then we're not going to have anything to do with you. <laughs> and you backed off. When God called me to do what I'm doing, women did not do what I'm doing.
break my heart No, you can't be fair, you just don't know I mean This time the monkey green Come on and cheer the event now Come on and move it, dance on down We're gonna dance all of the Cause we're gonna party till The party and the party vamps Dance with me, baby and champion To my current driving door I can feel the falling rain on my face I'm losing sleep and it feels like I'm fading away on my I'm floating through the dark It's time to lead me far down a path that leads to your embrace But I've got a long way My thoughts are going out of my way through a broken valley My faith is rolling deep in the shadows of my sleep I sit seeking
I mean, if, if you think it might be hard as a woman now to minister, you should have been trying it 45 years ago. So literally, and I'm not joking, I was asked to leave my church. And that was big because our whole life revolved around our church. Our social life, our kids went to school there, everything. And so when I made that decision, I not only made it for myself, but I made it for all my kids. And it's been hard on them over the years, too. A lot of people, we lost friendships. People just thought I had lost my mind. And, you know, people, people don't want to be associated with anybody that is going to be looked at as being anything other than totally normal. Well, you know what? I am normal. It's just a new normal. I, I may not be your normal or your normal or the world's standard of normal. And the devil kept trying to tell me that I needed to settle down and be a regular woman. I don't know what that is. I'm not it. I'm pretty sure of that. Come on, woman of God, don't ever try to be a regular woman. Be the person God wants you to be. People can be used by Satan. Even people who really love you can be used by Satan to keep you from your destiny. Don't let it happen. Don't compare yourself with other people. Who in the world wants to be like everybody else? One of a kind is more unique and more valuable. Paul said, had I been trying to be popular with people, I would not now be an apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ. Don't miss the miracle that God has for your life because you are addicted to wanting everybody to like you. Come on. You, you know, any, any Christian that goes full on with God, you're probably going to lose some friends. But they're, they're not the kind of friends you want anyway. They're not going to be there for you when you really need them. If somebody insists that you be what they want you to be to be your friend, then they're not a true friend. And the sooner you get rid of them, the better off you're going to be. Amen. Learn how to like yourself and then you're never lonely. Amen. 
I love spending time with me. I do. I get along good with myself. Shake off offense. The minute somebody offends you, say, nope. Anger. Negative attitude, complaining, self-pity. Treat them all like Paul treated that little snake. Shook it off. Come on, try one more time. So now see, we can have a secret. The next time somebody gets in your face, you can just smile at them and go, Acts 7, 20. It was at this critical time that Moses was born and he was lovely in the sight of God. For three months he was nourished in his father's house. Then, then when he was set outside to die, Pharaoh's daughter noticed and claimed him for herself and cared for him as her own son. Moses was educated in all the wisdom and culture of the Egyptians, a man of power and words and deeds. When he reached the age of 40, came into his heart to visit his brothers, the sons of Israel. He saw one of them being treated unfairly, and he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking and killing the Egyptians. Now, here's what I want you to see. Verse 25. He expected his countrymen to understand that God was granting them freedom through him, assuming that they would accept him, but they did not understand. You know, I expected people to understand that God was calling me to teach. I was not expecting them to have a big fit because I was in a female body. I was honestly just trying to do what I felt like God had called me to do. None of that stuff even, I didn't, I didn't even know women supposedly couldn't preach until people started telling me they couldn't. And by then it was too late, I was already doing it. I thought they'd understand. I wasn't expecting to lose all my friends. I wasn't expecting to be put out of my church. I mean, I thought people would be happy for me. I thought they'd be excited. Have you ever had a situation like that where you thought people were going to be really happy for you? And you just, I mean, the reaction you got was like weird. <laughs> Why can't you just be happy for me? Because people are jealous. <laughs> Period. Jealous. So let's talk about jealousy for a minute. <laughs> Don't be jealous of what other people have or covet what they have. Now, my husband got a word from God one time, which Dave is not, Dave doesn't go around saying, I have a word from God. So even when he does say that, it's good to listen. But he actually, this came to him in a meeting that we were doing. He basically had this message for people that until they could be happy for people who had what they wanted and didn't have yet, they would never get their own. Is that good enough? Okay. So let's just say that you're unmarried, you want to be married. Three of your best friends have gotten married in the last two years. You got so many bridesmaids dresses, you need a new closet. <laughs> now your very best friend comes to tell you that she's engaged and truth is, is you're just downright jealous. You're not happy for her. You pretend to be, oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> but you're not. You know what Paul told the people? He said, I know that you're spiritually immature because as long as there's jealousy and strife among you, are you not still in the baby stage of Christianity? See, what God wants us to do is trust him enough. Come on. Trust him enough 
to give each person, including us, what is right for us in the right way at the right time and not expect that we should always have it the way somebody else has it. Can you make a decision today that you are going to stop comparing yourself with other people? I wonder how many times in one day, just out and about in society that we compare something about ourselves to somebody else and it happens so fast we don't even realize that we do it. How freeing it is to not have to be jealous of what other people have. And to not even get into the judging of why God gave it to them. They don't deserve that, God. Why, why'd you give it to them? Why didn't you give it to me? That's none of our business. A lot of times, God will bless somebody right in front of you and give you, give them what you want, and he'll make it somebody that probably doesn't deserve it just to do an attitude check for you to see if you're ready. to see if you're ready to handle what you've been asking God to give you.